This is a big, long thank you story. I mentioned to AJ one day, I said, AJ, you know, you and me and Bob and Ken Scott, we should all get together and tell the story of thank you, because it's crazy. Like, we all think we did it. All of us did so much. Like, what is it? What did it end up as? I have no idea. Sometimes I listen to it, I think, did I do that or did they do that? I have no idea. Duran Duran's eighth studio album, Thank You, may be the most infamous album of their career. After their astronomical rise to fame in the early 80s, their struggle for survival at the turn of the decade, and their triumphant return to form with 1993's The Wedding Album, Duran Duran were ready to write the next chapter of their career. This is the untold story of Thank You, and the final instalment of The Road to Midazzaland. Strap yourself in, it's gonna be quite a ride. So Duran Duran are back, right? They are touring the world, they're selling out everywhere. People of a new generation love them. So what do you do for an encore? Well, if you're Duran Duran, you say you're gonna do a covers album and it's gonna be called Thank You. You know, let's cover Roxy Music, let's cover David Bowie. No, let's cover Public Enemy. Yeah, so Thank You was again for no reason but to get paid. It was never gonna be an album. No one considered it so. Simon and Nick and John in initially had no suggestions. We did Bowie stuff. It was like, you know, well, let's do a Beatles song. I mean, didn't you guys listen to anything other than Bowie and Prince? So I was not into it because it just, it was everything we were doing was kind of shitty. I didn't like it. We're doing an Alice Cooper song. We're doing a, you know, I don't know where they went, but Warren and I whipped up a bunch of quick demos of a lot of things. And then I guess the guys got more involved once we stopped. Because again, remember, when we started the album, this still was before the wedding album was out. We were already doing Thank You. This is 92. So the wedding album didn't take over our lives until we'd been working on Thank You for a few months. So what I'm saying, my understanding of the story is that now they go on the road and because they can do whatever they want and they want to get out of this record deal, I imagine, they figure let's finish this thing, right? So, hey, it's awesome. They're in Minnesota, let's go in Prince's studio. They're in New York, let's go in Power Station. You know, they're in LA, let's go in Record Plant. That's what they did. They had a great time. They made some great tracks. They had Tony Thompson on drums. So many different people got to play. They got to work with Ken Scott on tracks. But Warren was basically in charge, from what I can tell, because there wasn't anybody sort of, you know, you could say Ken, you know, Ken won't take credit for any of that because he didn't have control over it. He just, he just recorded them. You know, he, re he engineered a couple of sessions, basically. He didn't have the time to make it what it could have been or to say, hey guys, nah, let's do this one. You know, he never, it's not fair. And, and same with me. They did come up with some really good stuff, for sure, without me. It's not all about me. They came up with some really good stuff. Like Perfect Day, I didn't start Perfect Day and I didn't start watching The Detective, but I think of them as two of the better tracks. So anyway, then I got hired to do a record for Alan Frew as the lead singer in Glass Tiger. Nick called me half a dozen times and <laughs> I kept saying no. <laughs> he goes, JJ, we gotta sort this thing out. All right, thank you. Because they were just gonna dump it and do a new album, but again, the reception for, for Ordinary Rolling coming down was so big that there's no time to do another album. And we'd already done most of this with Between Us and that, it had already been done, mostly them on the road. So uh, he just said, can you, look, let's just fix it. I go, yeah, but I don't wanna work with Warren. You know, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna, I, you know, I'm spoiled now. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And he's like, no, 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 we'll do it right. We'll go on holiday. You know, he's going on holiday. Simon's going on holiday. We'll do it in the south of France. We'll rent some gear. We'll get them to drive it down from London, you know, and we'll, we'll work in the chateau and, you know, and Cap Dantive. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> that sounds good. But I'm literally, I remember I was in A&M and we were mixing the last song at A&M and the phone rings and it's, it's Nick. And he's like, JJ, you got, you got to do this. You're coming, right? And that was it. I mean, a week later, finished this Alan Frew record, 
Now I'm in France, waiting for the truck to come from London with all this equipment. We brought like two 24 track, you know, Sony digital tape machines are like this big, you know, like two of those and a mixer and all our gear and my gear and everything. And it was like, fucking hell. And we set it up in this house. And after like a week in the house, Nick and I couldn't stand it. We loved the house, but the room was terrible. So we uh, moved to another house. So we had to move the gear. <laughs> but finally we got down to it. And basically we just went through every tape and fixed every part. Like, I, I swear to you, I mean, some songs, it was as if they weren't even playing, they weren't listening to each other while they were playing. Other songs were brilliant. Like everything was great. Simon needed to do some singing. So we did, most of the singing we did in France except for the new songs that we did in LA. We did do a lot of vocals in south of France, which were great. Simon was great there. And of course, we had a killer time. I mean, just phenomenal. Michael Hutchins was our best buddy. And we'd go to his house for dinner up in the hills. And he'd come, come in his Jeep with the roof off, blasting, I'm a loser. Like back, like full blast. All, every day we'd hear him coming, right? Oh, Michael's coming. <laughs> there was some parties, there's some crazy things went on there. But we did get the work done um, and it was very tidy. When we finished, it was ready to be mixed. You know, we fixed the things that were out of time. And you know, I'd say the two that we, Nick and I put extreme time into was watching Detective and Perfect Day. But I know that Warren had put intensive time into them before we even got them. But not everything was together. Like I say, it was a, it was a real, really hard to explain. It was, it was so many tracks of stuff. And I was like, and when I didn't record it, it makes it really hard to figure out what was meant or what you had to do. Or, and plus, remember, we're in a room, what, a quarter the size of this, right? We're in like a little corner doing this with all this gear. Anyway, fuck, we did it, right? We did it. With Thank You nearing completion, the band were still searching for the right people to mix the record. By chance, it was Warren Cucurillo's former bandmate who unknowingly provided the missing link and introduced them to two people who had become integral to the band's sound for the next two albums. Well, how I got involved with Thank You was kind of a roundabout, strange way. I was playing with Dale Bazio of Missing Persons. I was writing and touring with her, and Warren had left to go to Duran Duran. She gave me his address and I sent a cassette with one side, all my weird orchestra performance art craziness to poetry. And then the other side were the songs that I had done with Dale. He loved everything, but he said, we're really intrigued with the sonic part of your performance art stuff. He said, it sounds massive. It's like, we're mixing this record. In comparison, it sound, our record sounds thin compared to your cassette. <laughs> he said, would you be interested in taking a crack at a Duran mix? And I said, oh, of course, I'd be honored, you know? So they're like, well, you gotta send us some stuff to give up to our management because they don't know who you are. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm just like a dude who lives under a piano. <laughs> I really had no major label credits other than like, I think I worked with Vinnie Vincent from Kiss. So they finally said, all right, you know, it's, it's like we're sending these two inch masters to some kid in Massachusetts that hasn't done anything, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the first song they sent me was 911 is a joke. And Bob St. John and I were doing a lot of work together at the time, and Bob and I went into a studio, got spec time, and spent, I don't know, three, probably three or four days putting it together, and we're getting close to sending it, and we both kind of looked at each other and like, this sounds too much like Duran Duran. It's like they liked my weird performance art stuff. It's like, I think they wouldn't really contact me to just do a straight mix of their stuff. What Anthony does is beyond description. And that's what Warren heard that he liked, and I started to think to myself, well, if that's what they heard, Maybe us just mixing the song, that's not what they want. So I called Anthony up, I said, listen, let's not send it. Let's just go in and fuck it up. Forget what we think it should be. They don't want anybody to just do a mix of it. They can hire anybody to do a mix of it. And honestly, I know four or five guys mixed on that record and their mixes aren't on the record, ours are. So I went to the studio owner, I said, hey, give us a couple more days. I think we ended up doing three more days. I recut the drums. I replaced the heavy guitar with like these samples of people blowing in conch shells. And I put the cowboy lady that you hear in the beginning of the song through the whole song. If you listen carefully, it goes through the whole song. You know, I brought in this friend of mine, Bobby, to play harmonica on it. I mean, I did a ton of stuff on it. I kind of reinvented the track as I would one of my performance art pieces. You know, put in that cool, kind of trendy 90s R&B loop under it with the 808. I remember sending it to them and being just a little bit scared. But, I, you know, to me, it's like, hey, no guts, no glory. Back then, I had a beeper. It was I didn't even have a cell phone yet. It was like before flip phones. And I got the beep and I pulled over and I went to like a store and I called in and it was Simon LeBon's voice on there. And I wish I had a way of saving it because I'll never forget it. He's like, Anthony, it's Simon LeBon. You're 
mad, lad. You're mad and we've got to get you over here straight away. That was the phone call. So that was like the phone call that kind of changed my life, really. So I was thrilled and, you know, we made the arrangements. I flew to a Metropolis in Chiswick and all I had was a, an Akai sampler and a, a Mac Classic. And then I had this surfboard, I called it. It was this big Akai controller. It was about this wide, about this long. So that was shipped. So I show up and I knock at the door and they're like, they're looking for a truck, you know, because like people like Trevor Horn would come there with like a, a truck full of gear, you know? And he's like, they're like, where's your stuff? And I'm like, oh, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked in and that was that started it and that's that's when we went to work on finishing up 911 is a joke and then from there we went into white lines and that took a very long time. It was really involved but it, it one song at a time we ended up, you know, spending a lot of time at Metropolis and doing a good amount of stuff. So it was a really really exciting time for me. Thank you is kind of disjointed but by its nature what was it going to be? Because that was a bunch of disparate songs put together. I know they spent years recording that. That record was actually more difficult to mix than Medazzo, and even though it didn't take as long, because the tracks were recorded at studios all over the world. You didn't know what you were getting. They didn't have track sheets. We worked on pretty much everything, except for watching The Detectives, I think was the only one we didn't do anything on. It was Drive-By on there. I don't think I did anything on that one. I think the, the rest of them, we added things and added and you know enhanced. You know, I put like the hippie chicks on, uh, I called it hippie chicks. There was these 60s girls. They were on Crystal Ship and it was just, you know, marrying what they had already done, which was wonderful. I think what they had was fantastic. It was a really s slow detail process. We amped bass parts through like SVT cabinets. We rented a ton of stuff. See, they were coming off a number one worldwide hit, so the budget was carte blanche as far as rental gear. We had a Fairchild limiter, you know, on the mix bus, and it was like, you know, everybody in London wanted to rent it, and we just kept it, you know? It was like, you know, we really were spoiled at the time, but it was fun. It was, it was a dream come true, really. They offered me a wonderful opportunity, and they were super thankful and gracious. Something interesting had happened when we did Thank You. They had so many people mix songs on it, and nobody liked them that when we mixed 911 as a joke, they were immediately like, after they got it, they're like, come over here, we got more songs for you to do. Not only do they cover 911 is a joke by Public Enemy, but then they record as one of their singles, another rap song, which is White Lines Don't Do It. But for credibility's sake, they bring on board the people who originally did the song, Grandmaster Flash, Melly Mel, and the Furious Five. The first song we did was White Lines, and we spent three days on that mix, you know, restructuring it. Steve Ferroni played drums on that track, and he's actually on the track in the choruses and towards the end of the song, and a lot of it is combined with Anthony's loops, which are brilliant. And we called Warren up, and, you know, we had gotten used to this concept of playing the songs over the phone. And, you know, evidently there's an art to playing music over the phone. I didn't know this. And Warren would say the most crazy things. He'd be like, I'd be holding the phone. He'd come back and says, hey, could you bring the vocal down half a dB? What, 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 what carbon-based life form can hear that on the phone anyhow? But I don't think Warren's from this planet, so we've got no worries there. So we had gone all the way to London, and I said to Warren, I says, he's like, yeah, man, this is sounding really good. He says, I said, well, you want to come over and hear it? He says, nah, play it over the phone. Anthony was in the bathroom. He comes up and he sees me in the control room like this, holding the thing. He's like, what are you doing? I says, Warren wanted to hear it. He says, over the phone? I says, yes, over the phone. And I'm talking to Anthony and I come back and Warren says, hey, can you play it again, but don't move the phone while you're playing it. So I went and I duct taped the freaking phone to a mic stand and stuck it in the middle of the room. And I said to him, I says, you gonna come over? He says, nah, man, I'm superstitious. You know, when the mix is done, I'll come by. And that's it, he was just down the street. You know? And and then that that was the first time we met him was right after we right after we finished White Lines. But even after that, we we'd see him occasionally when we were mixing, but he was home in his environment and that's what was working for everybody. And I could totally understand it. If you mix a song over and over again, you get PTSD. You don't want to hear the damn thing again. I had drinks one night with Simon in uh, Encino and the video came on for White Lines and Simon said that's my favorite video we've ever done. And I looked at it, you know, and it's mostly black and white, and it's, it's Simon bending down towards the camera and that, and he's got lots of energy in the song. Obviously, White Lines, fantastic. I play it all my gigs still to this day, you know, but that was his favorite. And I was thinking, wow, God, if you ask me my favorite Duran video, it'd probably be Save a Prayer, you know? And then there's that moment with the five of them are standing there looking up at Monument. It was just a moment in music history. But they actually loved the album, even though it was one of those interim albums. And for the viewers, 
Every band puts out one of those albums. When you see the live album or the greatest hits album, which has four tracks on it that you've never heard before, that was a filler album because the band probably had a five album deal with the record company and they'd already released four original ones and they're looking to get out the deal. So they put out a filler album. So for Duran, I don't know if it was their filler because they love some of the tracks on it and continue to play those in concert. But for radio, it did give us a big problem because how do we play that version rather than the original? But if you think that all they did was rap on that album, no, they didn't. They did go back to their roots. They love Velvet Underground. They love Lou Reed. So they covered Lou's Perfect Day. Obviously, from a, a music critic's point of view, the sheer brazen chutzpah of Duran Duran tackling not one but two Lou Reed songs in Perfect Day and Femme Fatale, the, the bonus track, that was just even more evidence that this band were washed up and desperate. I got to talk to Lou Reed about that at a record store that I worked at, and I told him, I said, you know, I love that Duran Duran covered one of his most famous songs, and he patted me on the head, and he said, they did a good job. <laughs> but he has said that that is the best cover of any of his songs by any artist. Duran Duran are probably the anti-Velvet Underground, you know, the least transgressive, least smacky, least New York band you could ever find. I think for Nick Rhodes personally, to get the cosign of his biggest hero, Lou Reed, it just made it worth it. Possibly the best re-recording of a song of mine that I've heard is absolutely wild about it. One of the things I liked about their version of Perfect Day was the fact that it was such an accurate take on it. They recorded it the way I meant it. He also said I was cute, and he patted me on the head, and he was also going to the Dungeon, which is an s and shop at the time. But I don't have to add all that. My deal was at least let me do a couple of songs, because other than a couple of songs, I didn't like most of the record. And my suggestion was Lay Lady Lay. So I did a quick demo of it, and uh, Simon liked it, I guess because the next thing he's on the plane and you know he came and we did it we did the vocals here at record plant i'm trying to think what happened after that oh we used abe laboreal jr on drums because steve ferroni couldn't make it and steve suggested abe who at that time had never done a big session it's his first big gig right for duran duran <laughs> pretty nice right? and he was brilliant he was exactly what we wanted but the final track also has aj on it so it's kind of i don't know he's playing the same part let, let, let's face it what I was doing with Lay Lady Lay was, I was trying to make a song that sounded like Ordinary World and Come Undone combined. And if you listen, that's exactly what it is. It's got the kind of Come Undone guitar, it's got the Ordinary World guitar, it's got the chords, I mean, I just thought, I don't know, it, it, it was one of those, you wake up in the morning and you're trying to think, what song could he do? I would, who would think of a Bob Dylan song? Not me, you know, I did, I don't know how, right? Like, <laughs> so, I love that so much, and Simon, what? Ah, he just rocked on it, you know, love what he did. And it took the Italians to release it, right? I think it's the only people that released it. And it was a smash, because it is. And uh, but Warren hated it. You know, he put a great part on it, but you know, sometimes with Warren, the first impressions of what he does, I think he's trying to sabotage the track, right? And then like a few days later, I'm going, hmm, <laughs> that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> but it, 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 it's because he, you know, he's all, that's what's been so good about the special stuff they did together too, is he does something that you just don't expect, right? He doesn't just play chords. He doesn't just, you know, you know, like, it's pretty brilliant, right? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, yeah, he added to that, Nick added to that, but we basically did it here, and then we mixed it here. And then, I don't know, I guess as part of the whole let's mix it again story, they mixed it all again, and Bob and AJ added stuff, I guess, I can't tell. Doesn't sound like they added anything, but they did. So, I mean, it. <laughs> well, they ended up using my, some of my stuff married with whatever they that we didn't mix that one but they did use a bunch of my tracks uh, my Wurlitzer pianos in there and like some of that Caribbean percussion and I did like a, uh, a drum part with multi rods and that's layered over another drum track that somebody else played so it's the way they they married it all pretty pretty well the person who was most aware of stuff we replaced was John Taylor who wasn't too happy sometimes and what happened was we knew he was already pissed off at us you see, we did a version of Lay Lady Lay, the version that's not on the record. Basically, we threw out everything except the vocal and the guitar part and some of Nick's ambient sounds in it. And 
We were locked in the studio up in Massachusetts in Longview Farm. It was winter. We were there for three or four days. Anthony replayed the drum tracks. He did four, you know, eight tracks of percussion. And you know, we did all the tracking there. We mixed it in Boston. And it was just, to me, I love that track. It's a shame that it didn't get released. I did new, a new drum and rhythm treatment, some world of piano and some other things. And it had almost like a little bit of an African third world kind of feel to it. And the bass that was there just didn't really go with my, my syncopation you know, in, in everything. We uh, ended up cutting fretless bass to it, and um, yeah, he, I'm sure he was upset. The version that's on the record that I think Tim Palmer mixed, and I love everything Tim Palmer does, except that track, because he took the tracks we threw out and the tracks we recorded, and he put them all in their song together, which they were never meant to be like that. When the management heard my version, they said, that's cool, but it's out there, you know, so it was a little bit too left of center, you know, which is, often the case with a lot of things I do. <laughs> but that's where I come from, you know? It's like, to me, it's like always trying not to be too generic, you know? I don't know why it got rejected, but I have a feeling John might have got it rejected because we replaced the bass track. We hired somebody to come in and play a fretless bass on it. And hey, that, John could totally have done that. But at that point, we're trying to finish the song and things were different. If it was now we do that, you just call John up and say, I need a bass track on this. Can you play it? And you can set up a session and do it. But the way things were working at the time, it wasn't going to be a possibility to just, you know, pop in and, and just start start recording bass. Um, I'm sure that rubbed him the wrong way, and I'm sure in his mind that, you know, for the band, it's like, well, we've spent like years doing this record, what's wrong with waiting a little longer, you know, to get it right, you know? But um, that's beyond the scope of our job to say, all right, well, let's wait for John. For me, it was always just, what's the best sound for this song? I don't care who does it. I didn't care if Warren did it or, or he did it, or I did it with a synth, or Nick did it with a synth. It didn't, to me, that never really mattered. I, I'm always about just the over the big picture and trying to make it as good as it can be. And so sometimes I got caught in the crossfire of that. There was one story where John and Simon came to Boston unannounced, and John was gonna recut some of the bass parts, and nobody told uh, anybody that this was gonna happen. Somebody in the, their camp, I won't name names, told me, don't say anything. If Warren calls, don't tell them that they're there. I felt really bad about that because Warren was always my sort of like liaison to, to everything musical. Me being a Zappa fan and all the respect I have for him and, and, and Nick too. I mean, those two guys were the musical core of everything at that time. And I, I, I just wanted to be good to everybody and just, you know, do the right thing. But I was like really uncomfortable with this situation. So I just said to him, I said, hey, why don't you just call the control room in like 20 minutes, okay? I got him in the middle of something. And I made sure that Simon picked up the phone in the control room and it was Warren. <laughs> so I was off the hook. In the end, I, I you know, I, I respect John's playing. He's an amazing bass player and I'm a fan. I think the management kind of maybe on a few occasions said, oh, Anthony preferred this or that. You know, it's easier to pass the buck, you know? But it wasn't always that, you know? So might as well get all this out, right? I'm sure people are interested but there was nothing clandestine about any of it. And thank you, everything felt disjointed. We'd finish a mix and a courier would come and pick up a dat and bring one to Warren and then another one to Nick and another one to Simon and we'd send one to John in LA. So that didn't feel like a band to me. As the band continued to work on Thank You, it proved to be a difficult album to complete with John Taylor in particular being unhappy with several of the mixes. I could see why he would reject them because, you know, they're different from what the band would be about. You know, you've got that dynamic in the band where, you know, Nick and Warren were like this and Simon and John were like this. But Simon could be swayed, you know. John, like I said, I don't even have a right to have an opinion because I didn't work with him for more than like an hour, you know. And we hung out and he's a really cool guy, but that's all I can actually say. Did I record him? No, I think he's an amazing bass player. Thank you. You know, while I know, you know, critically, it wasn't the biggest success, I know a lot of fans love that record. 
And I think they're really good remakes of the songs that inspired them. They're songs that, to me, I, I don't think I'd ever want to do a remake of I Want to Take You Higher. That doesn't make any sense at all. I like the way both of those versions came out. I like Nick's version was the one with the more like uh, mysterious ways. They, they said, we want a kind of a hi-hat like Mysterious Ways by U2. I was taking a lot of direction from the guys at that point. I hadn't really gotten as far into the relationship. Like on the Dazzleland, they kind of just gave me a carte blanche to do whatever I wanted most of the time. But in, I was walking more on eggshells at that point, trying to just make sure everybody liked, you know, what we were doing. They had a lot of input, and I love Nick's keyboard parts, and, you know, Warren's guitar part's brilliant. You know, and people, like, every now and then you get some jerk say, say, oh, yeah, I heard Nick didn't really play keyboards. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He's like an amazing synthesis, and he comes up with brilliant parts. You know, it's like, I always squash those myths that people will sometimes throw at you. You know, because he's, you know, he's fantastic. Before you slip into unconsciousness, I'd like to have another kiss, another flashing chance at bliss, another kiss. I love Crystal Ship. I just love the way Simon sings Morrison on that. I love the whole album. I mean, I like all those songs. Ball of Confusion, I think, is really cool. That linear funk beat is sort of my signature beat, so it was a really a thrill as a drummer to play on that. And at the time, I was studying this book called Future Sounds by David Garibaldi, the drummer in Tower of Power. If you listen to that song, if you count the rhythm, there's one point where I displace the whole groove, and all the different parts of the, that measure in a linear fashion become flipped upside down so it's pretty progressive you know and uh, so it was just cool to be able to sneak that in there and it was just so many highlights and, and things on there I, yeah I, I love the singing I, I like you know even the songs I didn't work on like watching the detectives and the show for all that stuff I loved uh, all the Simon's vocals I just thought he was just he's always such a great singer the release of thank you in April of 1995 marked yet another turning point for Duran Duran while the wedding album had re-established the band as a commercial force their covers album was met with mixed reviews and considered to be a misstep. A point, though, the band's collaborators and many of the original artists disagree with. I think Duran Duran's enthusiasm for doing covers is great. I wish more artists and bands would cover each other's work. It's something everybody used to do, you know. It's another framing device, actually, of, of saying to your fan base, look, this is our record collection, here are our inspirations, we're going to pay tribute to either individual records, songs, or even this genre. Ah, uh, Duran Duran, eh? Is this thing on? And he recorded my song, Success. Hey, is this thing on? Shoot back. Option. The Thank You album just, it felt desperate and naff and cringy. And music fans who knew Public Enemy and Velvet Underground would think it was a diabolical smash and grab raid on their great heroes. But younger fans who didn't know those songs would just be baffled by them. I, I, don't, I don't feel the same way. I, I feel like they honored every single person they covered. I know Elvis Costello loved it. I know Dylan loved it. I mean, how could you not love that version of Thank You? It's wonderful. Simon's singing is gorgeous. Duran Duran Thank You was exceptional, really. I think the Duran Duran thing is really good because it's kind of, the way that he sings it, Simon, is uh, it's a totally different way of singing it, and it works great. It's real good. When the covers album, when Thank You came out, it was hard for us to find tracks on it to play on K-Rock. It really just didn't fit. It seemed strange, and we understood why they played homage to so many of the acts because Duran have always been so generous with their praise. I mean, for example, you talk to Nick and he'll say how he loved Japan in the early days and Bowie, of course, and Roxy Music and T-Rex and the obvious ones. But they've always been very, very generous saying their influences and where they came from. So when that album came out, it was like, yeah. I, see, I thought it was a ballsy move. Uh, I, I know, like I said, I know critically people are like, well, who do these guys think they are? I'm like, who do you think they are? They're fucking Duran Duran, that's who they are. The White Line version that they did now had the potential to be in a big record, you know, all over the world. Even though the critics hated the album, the artists that we covered all loved it. So it was, it, I think at that time, the press really just liked to pick on them for like no particular reason at whatsoever. You know what I mean? I just have that weird feeling that it was, you know, it, it just was too much for them to hear. Brand to Brand did not even want to joke over and I just got finished hearing it for my first time. Duran. I love it when Duran Duran do covers. 
I think it's fun. Music's not that serious. We play music. People forget that word, it's play. And not everything's gonna work for everybody, you know? It did give off the feeling of a band who were flailing to survive by clinging on to somebody else's cultural cachet, i.e. the Velvet Undergrounds. One of the things I like about Duran Duran is, I think when they first came out, they were thought of like pretty boys, and they, they went and they made the mistake of having it hit right off the bat. That's kind of the kiss of death because you dismissed six months later. But they've hung together and they're a real band. Yeah, you know, Duran Duran, oh God, what's this? A bunny covering a bunch of people's songs? What's wrong with these guys? They're, they're done, they're done. They, they can't do this anymore. And, you know, I thought it was a ballsy move, personally. There were some really good reviews, too. Besides the really bad ones, there were some people that really got it, you know? In, in hindsight, I, I don't think it is, by any means, the worst record of all time, you know? I think it's, I think it has uh, some fantastic moments on it. Thank You seem like a strange left turn for this band to do, a way to, some people say, finish out their contract. But when I look back at it, I think musically, not only it was daring, I mean, 911 is a joke and white lines, but it was an interesting time. And you can never say that Duran Duran are predictable. They are never predictable. In terms of appealing to a new generation, that just wasn't going to happen, no matter how many ill-advised covers of Public Enemy they ended up trying to do. I thought it was brilliant. I mean, of course I'm going to say that, yeah. <laughs> The first 15 years of Duran Duran's career were a head spinning roller coaster ride that very few artists today will ever experience. But their incredible story doesn't end here. Duran Duran have never shied away from taking chances, and in 1997, they would release the most experimental album of their career. Join us next time as we sink deeper and deeper into Medazaland. It was the hottest day in July. Along Santa Monica Boulevard, cars were stood still in a gleaming metal tube stretched all the way from Highland back to La Brea. She met under the Los Angeles sunshine. A young man was sitting at the wheel on his way to make a pickup. On his way to make a pickup. Turned off Turned the off echo. Off. Rolled down the window. And began to sweat. to sweat. Out over the Hollywood Hills, he saw the clouds building like great dark towers of rain. Ready to come tumbling down. Not a day too soon. And as the music drifted in, 